بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته I want to start with, with sharing a hadith with you um, which perhaps you've heard before a narration from our mother Aisha radiallahu anha in which she, she talks about the revelation the Prophet had received in the early days right so the Quran that was being revealed to the Prophet in Mecca and you have to understand that the context of what she's talking about. She's talking about a time when the Sahaba were actively being targeted, tortured, and even killed. When the Prophet himself and his family were being targeted and tortured and attacked and the like. This was, this was the time in which she's referring to these verses or the surahs that were revealed. She says that if the first revelation, she says the first revelation that was revealed was the surah, the surahs that, uh, that, talked a lot about paradise and hellfire. Surah Al-Mufassal, the surahs from Surah Qaf or Surah Hujrat all the way to Surah Nas, in which you find frequently the Akhirah mentioned. Right? And she says that if the first thing that was revealed was the Ahkam, right? La tashrabul khamr, don't drink alcohol. She says the people would have said, we're not going to leave alcohol. Or if the first revelation was, don't commit intercourse, the people would have said we would never leave that. But she says the first thing that was revealed was the surahs that connected people's hearts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to akhirah. Right, until the hearts became softened and attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then halal and haram came down. Right? Once, the heart, once the heart's attached to Allah, once the heart's aware of Jannah and Hellfire, then it's easier to leave off that which Allah forbids and to do that which Allah commands. And so when the revelation for the prohibition of alcohol came, the, the streets of Medina were flowing with alcohol. And how that's remarkable, right? We in our own country in America, we had a period where Alcohol was forbidden. And what happened when that law came out? People were bootlegging it left and right. Right? Probably consumption increased instead of going down. Now why is that? There's a difference in, in the state of the heart before it happened. Right? So it's a very interesting concept because, again, she's talking about a time when the Sahaba were being targeted and tortured. Right? So in the early days of Islam, we find Sumayya radiallahu anha, the first martyr in Islam, being tied to you know, a trunk and her husband and her son and they're being tortured. We see Umayyah ibn Khalaf torturing Bilal ibn Rabah and putting a huge boulder on his chest and, and beating him. And he would say in response to that, what? Ahadun Ahad. And they asked, why Ahad? Why are you saying Ahad? What, what, what made that your slogan, O Bilal? You know what he said in response? He said, I knew that that particular word is what made them the most angry. That's remarkable. He's saying that which he knows will increase his punishment. Increase the torture. But he, ahadun ahad. Right? When Khabab, he was, he was placed on burning coals. And so later when they migrated to Medina and the Sahaba were sitting together, Ibn Khattab was there, Bilal was there, Khabab was there, and they were talking to each other about their earlier days of Islam. And the, what they went through. And so each person was sharing what they went through. So Khabbab who he didn't say a word. He simply lifted up his, his garment and showed them his back. And they saw literally the holes that were burned into his back. That's what he went through. And the Prophet is seeing all this. He sees you know, the family of Yasir being tortured and he says, Isbiru ala Yasir fa inna al -janna. Patience, O family of Yasir. You're being promised paradise. He's seeing what's happening and he knows that the victory of Allah will come. But what's interesting is some of the Sahaba seeing what, was, what they were seeing. It's only natural when you see so much oppression and, and dhulm and the like that you will, you'll want to retaliate. So they wanted to fight back. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in Surah An-Nisa about the mindset of the Sahaba at that time. 
He says, أَلَمْ تَرَ إِنَ الَّذِينَ قِينَ لَهُمْ كُفُّوا أَيْدِيَكُمْ وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةَ He says, do you not look or have you not seen those who were told, كُفُّوا أَيْدِيَكُمْ Hold your hands back. Meaning you are not given permission at this point to retaliate or to fight. But what does Allah say instead? You can't fight, but what? وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ But rather, establish the prayer. وَآتُ الزَّكَاةِ And give charity. Take care of the poor and the needy and the, and the hungry and those who are, who are left without any resources. So you find in the early days that the Prophet ﷺ, even though they're not fighting back, he's building them. He's still meeting in Darul Arqam. He's still meeting in their makeshift masjid at the time. Right? He's still teaching the Sahaba. And while he's teaching them the basics of the religion, the basics of belief, outside, some of their own family, some of their own brothers and sisters are going through the torture that they're going through. But he continued to teach. And this is interesting. He continued to teach to build the people because that wasn't a time where they were to fight. Allah didn't give that, that, that order. وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاءَ Establish your connection to Allah. Rectify your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Take care of the poor and the needy. And when you do that, these same people who the Prophet ﷺ was teaching, tomorrow, they will be capable of defending the Muslims. Because we aren't a people who are given victory by numbers or strength. Right? إِنَّا لَمْ نُنصَرْ بِالْكَثْرَةِ We aren't given victory by the numbers that we have. But the Prophet was building those people for tomorrow. For that time. And so we hear, we see what's happening nowadays. We see what's happening across the Muslim world. And we hear from the mimbar, we hear from our, our teachers that work on yourself. Work on what you can control. And I, don't want, and I wanted to start with, with this concept because I feel like sometimes people say it's a cop-out. That it's a cop-out. Well, look at the Prophet ﷺ, why Allah revealed the verse specifically about this. That what you can do in your time now and what you can control, you master that. Because you see, we, you know, Khabab, the same companion who was tortured, he comes to the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ is aware, fully aware of what he's going through. And after going through one of these torture sessions, he goes to the Prophet ﷺ and he says, Ya Rasulullah, Ala tad'u ala ha'ula al qawm, Ala tansuru lana. He says, O oh, Messenger of Allah, will you not make dua against these people? Will you not ask Allah for a victory? And the Prophet he became, he became a little agitated. He stood up. And he said that, Wallahi, there are people who came before us, who they were brought and they were literally cut in half. And there were others who iron was used to remove their flesh from their body. But that didn't, that didn't drive them away from the path of Allah. Meaning they gave up everything. But they stood and they stayed firm. And then he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will most definitely give victory to this religion. But we are people who are rushing. Who is he speaking to? To Khabbab, one of the companions of Allah who was going through some of the most severe torture. Right? It's interesting when you, when you find the conversation between Heraclius, Hercules, and Abu Sufyan. You know, Prophet he sent letters to different leaders. So he sent a letter to uh, Hercules, who was a leader of the Persians in, in Bilad al-Sham. And so it's a letter inviting him to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to Islam. And so Hercules sends for, are there any merchants, any people from Arabia who are in town that I can question? And Abu Sufyan was there, who was one of the biggest enemies of Islam at the time. And so they bring Abu Sufyan and they bring his companions and they bring him in front of Hercules in his court. And Hercules asks, who amongst you is closest to the Prophet ﷺ? And he says, I am. Abu Sufyan says, I am. So he tells him to come forward. And he tells all of his companions to stay back. And he tells them, if he tells me a lie, I want you to indicate to me that he's lying to me. So Abu Sufyan can't see them. Right? So he's basically confirming that he's going to get the truth. Abu Sufyan's in the front, he can't turn, he's not allowed to turn around to look, and he's being questioned and he has to respond truthfully, or else if the people behind him say something, he'll be, who knows what would happen. 
Right? And Abu Sufyan, he, he says himself in the narration that I only spoke the truth out of fear I would be discredited from the people behind me. So he asked him a series of questions about the Prophet ﷺ, but then he asked a very interesting question. He says, فَهَلْ يَرْتَدُّ أَحَدٌ مِّنْهُمْ سَخْطَةً لِدِينِهِ بَعْدًا يَدْخُلَ فِيهِ He says, the followers of Muhammad ﷺ, do any one of them, after embracing Islam, leave the religion? Do any of the followers of Muhammad Sallallahu after embracing Islam, leave the religion because of some dislike they have towards it or something? Do they find some, some pro something problematic? It's an interesting question because we look around our ummah now and what do we see? We see a lot of our youth and our community, people who are leaving Islam. And Abu Sufyan says no. Now what's sad is, we have in our community people who are leaving Islam, but they weren't going through what Khabbab was going through. They weren't going through what Sumayya was going through. Maybe they're scared for getting a, a, a nasty look at work, or being scolded for getting, getting, getting their foot caught in the sink, or being harassed or verbally abused or whatever it is, or just seeing the state of the Muslim Ummah as a whole, and having to worry about that, having to answer to that at work or in, amongst their social circles, whatever it is. And so we leave, we have those who will leave the religion. But Abu Sufyan said no. The earliest generation of the Muslims who were going through the most difficult tests didn't leave the religion. And Abu Sufyan, after asking a series of questions, you know, he's asking, then he responds. And you know what he says about this question? He says, كَذَلِكَ الْإِيمَانِ كَذَلِكَ الْإِيمَانِ He's not surprised by the answer. That no one's leaving, despite what they're facing. That no one at all is leaving. He says, because that's the nature of faith. إِذَا خَالَطَتْ بَشَاشَتُهُ الْقُلُوبِ When it truly enters the heart, the heart embraces it with such a, a, a such a, 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 and such a intense em, a, a embracement that it, it never can leave it off. That's what iman does. When the heart it truly sets in the heart, there is nothing more joy. It brings more joy to a believer than that. There is nothing of more value to a believer than that. And that's why they could go through what they went through and be like Bilal and say, Ahadun Ahad, bringing more punishment upon him. Because when they would do that, he would smile. You know what Asiya, bint Muzahim, the wife of Fir'aun, Asiya alayhi salam, one of the greatest women in the history of the world, married to the most hated and cursed individual in the history of the world. When Fir'aun found out that she was a believer, what happened? He brought her out and he laid her down. This is his wife. And he st drives stakes through her limbs and pins her on the ground. And they begin torturing her. They begin torturing her. And even Fir'aun turns to... This is his wife. And he turns to his... his um, his like, you know, his advisors and the not, and whatnot, and he, you know what he sees? Subhanallah. Asiya begins laughing, begins smiling. Asiya begins smiling as she's being tortured, and he says, "Ala ta'jab, ala min jununiha." Fir'aun says, "Aren't you like amazed by her? She's lost her mind. She's gone crazy." We're torturing her and she's smiling. You know why she was smiling? Once Iman enters like that, the heart embraces it in such a taste. You know what she says? Allah you know, compiled this for us in the, history, in the Quran. As an example for all of mankind. وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا امْرَأَةَ فِرْعَوْنَ Allah has set an example for all the believers, believing men and women, the wife of Fir'aun. 
إذ قالت رب ابن لي عندك بيتا في الجنة. When she said, Oh Allah, build for me not just a palace and not just a home in paradise, but Oh Allah, build for me a home next to you in paradise. And so, as she was being tortured, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened up the skies and allowed for her to see her home in paradise. She saw what no other eye could see. And so, seeing the reward Allah has prepared for her, she was smiling. And then she passed away and she went to her home next to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Jannah. عندك بيتا في الجنة كذلك الإيمان right and so we find for us now in this days in these days of difficulty the Prophet Sallallahu is building his Sahaba by focusing on their relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala and their relationship with the society and how they're taking care of the the poor and the downtrodden and the oppressed of society right and Interestingly enough, you know, this concept of tezkiyah, of purifying the soul, purifying it meaning by cleansing of its ills, you know, of arrogance and, and jealousy and resentment and anger, and also purifying the heart from that which harms it, which is any, any form of disobedience of Allah. And also from the purification of the heart and the soul is by doing good, all sorts of good. Whether it be in your character, or whether it be in your ibadah and your, your external acts of worship like making dhikr or serving your parents or, or giving in charity. All of that is part and parcel of this concept of tazkiyatun nafs. Right? But when Ibrahim السلام, he made a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet السلام, he would say that I am the answer of the dua of Ibrahim السلام. Right? And what's interesting is that when Ibrahim السلام, made the dua to Allah, asking Allah to send what would be Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He says, رَبَّنَا وَبَعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِكَ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ Allah says, He says, O uh, oh, oh, our Master, raise from amongst them a messenger from themselves who will recite to them your verses. And He says, who will teach them the book and the wisdom, and who will purify them. Right? He makes a dua, O oh Allah, raise a messenger from amongst them, and he asks for four things. Teaching them the book. He says, recite to them your verses, teach them the Quran, teach them the sunnah, and tazkiyah. Well, you zakki him, and then he will purify them. Right? He mentions four things. Now when Allah answers the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam in Surah Ali Imran, it's interesting how Allah answers it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعْثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indeed bestowed His favor upon the believers when He raised from amongst them a messenger. Now the four things that Ibrahim asked for were recite the Qur'an, Recite to them your verses, teach them the Qur'an, teach them the sunnah, and purify them. In that order. Allah says in response, يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ Allah changed the order. He brought this concept of, of purifying them second, and then teaching them the verses and the, and the book and the sunnah, third and fourth. Very interesting. And with Surah Al-Shams, Allah Subh'ana begins the Surah, وَالشَّمْسِ وَضُحَاهَا وَالْقَمَرِ إِذَا تَلَاهَا وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا جَلَّاهَا For these first eight, seven, eight, nine verses, he goes on taking oath after oath after oath. Eight oaths Allah Subh'ana wa ta'ala takes to start the Surah. What's he taking an oath about? What's so important that's coming? Allah Subh'ana makes it very clear. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا the one who is successful is the one who is able to purify his soul. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَ Right? And who's the one, what's the reward for those people? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَالْوَزْنُ يَوْمَئِذٍ الْحَقُّ فَمَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Who are those who have this concept of, of falah? 
قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا Who are the people who succeed, those who purify their souls. Allah says they'll be those who their deeds will, they will be heavy on the Day of Judgment. Right? So purifying the soul, brothers and sisters, is a critical concept. The Prophet he, he engaged from the earliest of days with the Sahaba. So that's why later in life, when some of the Sahaba were later in the seerah, after some of the Sahaba had died in the Khilaf of Abu Bakr and Umar and the like, the Khilaf of Umar when the Muslims in, 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 in Northern Africa had called for reinforcements. They asked for 8,000 men. Umar al-Khattab sent 4,000 men. And they said, he said in response to the letter, he says, I'm sending at the head of each thousand one man who is equal a thousand. Each one man who is equal a thousand. Like Sheikh Farhan said, he didn't leave behind, Sallallahu Alaihi didn't leave behind books. He didn't leave behind books. He left behind men and women. And where did they come from? From this process of purifying themselves, leaving off that which Allah dislikes, building that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And you know, sometimes, you know, I remember watching this video on YouTube about this brother who, who converted to Islam. And he's, he's, he's sitting at nighttime looking out the window. And he's, he's, on, he's, 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 he's on the edge. He's ready to jump into the water and embrace Islam. He's just waiting for a sign. Right? He's talking about this experience. He's waiting for a sign, right? So he's waiting for like, like a shooting star or like a bird to fly right in front of the window or something, you know? And like nothing happens. He's like, come on, God, now's the time. <laughs> right? he's, like, he's, he's giving the speech and he's saying like what he's going through, right? He's like, just, you know, I'm ready. Just show me something. And like nothing happens. Right? Nothing happens. And so he opens up the mushaf and he, subhanAllah, comes to the verse. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, indeed, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, and the alternation of the light and day, is a sign for people who reflect. So the sign's right in front of you. The sign was right there the whole time. Right? And so sometimes in our lives, before we embark on this self-purification, self-motivation, self-rectification, Right? Fixing our lives, fixing our mistakes, making changes, committing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We wait for that moment, that right moment. And that moment's now. There is no perfect moment. The perfect moment is now. There isn't anything you can... You, it's not worth waiting to get into a car accident and be taken to the ER and be put on life support and then you miraculously survive. Now you're ready? It's not worth waiting for when I'm ready for Hajj when I'm 70, 80 years old, when that day may never come. Is it not time? Is it not time for the believers? Is it not time for the believers that their hearts become softened? Right? And they become attached to Allah. They become humbled to Allah and what He has revealed. And what does that mean to be attached and to be humble to what Allah has revealed? That means you submit to the Allah, Allah and His Messenger Wasallam. You know, for all the Prophet Wasallam and what he went through, you know, for us to be sitting here now, it's a testimony to the, the truth of His Nubuwa. To have his message reached far and wide, as he said in the hadith, "Sayyidu Hadidin ma balagh al-laylu wa nahar." Right, it's going to reach wherever the night and the day reaches. Right, and he 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 spent his life, he dedicated his life as a Sahaba did for us. Right, when he would cry at night and his feet would swell, he would say, "Ummati, ummati, my ummah, my nation," and he says that he will be waiting for us on the day of judgment, waiting to see us. At the Hawd al kawthar at his pond of, of which if you drink from it, you'll never feel thirsty again. He's waiting to see us. Right? But that opportunity, that chance, we, it's our responsibility. We can't outsource our spirituality. Meaning we can't just depend on someone to, you know, drop some amazing, you know, gem or lecture or something and you're like, oh wow, that's part of it. Being here is part of it. Coming to these programs and attending halaqat is part of it. Alhamdulillah, one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, he says he once he was walking out in the streets and he says, nafaqa alhamdulillah, nafaqa alhamdulillah. I've become a hypocrite. Abu Bakr meets him and says, why are you saying that? He says, when I'm with the Prophet ﷺ, my iman is so high. And when I'm home with my wife and my kids, my iman drops down. So I'm a hypocrite because my iman is not the same. 
And Abu Bakr says, well, that's true for me too. So let's go to the Prophet Sallallahu so they go to the Prophet and they tell him, O oh, Messenger of Allah, when we're with you and you remind us of hellfire and Jannah and the mercy of Allah and the like and all these things, our Iman is flying through the roof. But when we go home and we get back to the grind of life, our Iman kind of goes down. You know what the Prophet said in response? He says, he says that, you know, this is... He says, Ya hamdala sa'ata wa sa'a. He says, you know... A time for this and a time for that. He says, and if you were like you, He says, and if your hearts were at the level they were at when you were in this gatherings of remembrance of Allah, he says, He says, the angels would come down into the streets and dab you up. Say salam to you, shake your hands. That's what kind of love. So it's, it's not possible. But what is important, is that these, that you're committed, right, to attending these kind of, you know, gatherings, local halaqat, you know, like you were saying, having teachers, having mentors, people who can kind of help guide you and, you know, keep you in check. And I'll, I'll end with this because my time is up. But when you begin this journey, it's very, very important. You see, human beings naturally, we don't want to feel bad about ourselves. We don't want to. And so if we make decisions that start taking us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what happens is you naturally shut down. You naturally shut out people who may want the best for you. Right? So you see a brother on campus who now has a girlfriend and you go, yo bro, let's, let's talk. And he will say, no, 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 don't judge me, man. Heard that before? We've all heard it, right? Don't judge me. Right, but what that is, is our natural like, self, psyche self-defense def mechanism kicking in because we don't want to feel bad about ourselves. So we'll justify whatever we're doing for whatever reason. Oh man, I'm trying to get married to her. It's all good in the hood. You know, like, you know what I'm saying? My parents know about it. Whatever. whatever. It's just we're MSA, man. It's all good. Right? We just want, however we want to justify it. But that concept of don't judge me is destroying us. Because you want people who will tell you when you see you going wrong, reminding you what, what, what you're doing. Don't let that, that shaitan trick your mind and run 360s around you. Because that's what's happening. You know, we're, we're fooling ourselves into thinking that we're, 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 you know, these people are judgmental, or they, don't, they, they don't know me, they don't know what I'm going through, blah, blah, blah. Look, you want to be around people who want the best for you. You want to be around people, not yes men, Right? You don't want yes men. You want people who are going to help keep you in check. And that takes a stronger personality because it takes some strong introspection. When you're being told something, to acknowledge the truth in it, to acknowledge the truth in it, it's a challenge. But here's the deal. If we want to embark on this journey of having Iman truly soak into our hearts, and we ask Allah to bless us with that firmly rooted Iman in our hearts so that whatever trials come our way, our heart stays firm. Because these these mistakes that we do, they add up. They add up, right? And it may be because of that, that when the fitna comes, we, 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 fall, we succumb to that fitna, right? So we, we have to do the best we can. Every day is a struggle. Every day is a struggle. But Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ اهْتَدَوْا زَادَهُمْ هُدَى وَآتَهُمْ تَقْوَاهُمْ Those who don't just, you know, ask for guidance, but اهتدوا comes from the, the family of like, really working on it every day. You know, struggling, striving your best to get guidance. For those people, Allah says, Zadahum huda. Allah will increase them in guidance. وَأَتَاهُمْ تَقْوَاهُمْ And He will give them that awareness and consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us in purifying our souls and, and ourselves and, in, and drawing closer to Him and to keeping our faith firm, inshallah ta'ala, um, so we can be at a point where, you know, our iman is strong, our faith is strong, and we can be a light to others as well and help them on this journey. It's, it's a challenge. We're all in the same boat. We're all in the same boat. A struggle every day for everybody. But if we stick together, al-birri wa taqwa. If we help each other in righteousness, then inshallah ta'ala we can overcome shaitan and our, and our weaknesses.